evil children who ever lived. Some decide to murder little babies, while others go murder sprees. So, let's take a look into it. First up, we have Brian and David Freeman. Brian and David were only 17 and 16 respectively, when they bludgeoned their parents, Brenda and Dennis Freeman, and their younger brother, Eric to death. Eric was only 11 at the time. Brian and David had a strict Jehovah's Witness upbringing. They resented the religion's harsh rules and restrictions, and, by the time they were teenagers, they had become active skinheads. They had shaved their heads, tattooed their foreheads, and wore military-style uniform as a sign of their Nazi affiliation. Brian had a dark, violent side, and experimentation with drugs landed him in treatment facilities on more than one occasion. He, David and their cousin, Ben, were planning to form their own neo-Nazi organization called Berserker. They threatened their parents and terrorized their 11-year-old brother. One Sunday night in Salisbury Township, Pennsylvania, the brothers came home and savagely stabbed their mother to death after stuffing a pair of shorts in her mouth. They then went upstairs where they beat their father and 11-year-old brother to death in their sleep with an aluminum baseball bat and three-foot pickaxe handle. It was every parent's nightmare. In the end, Brian confessed to killing his mother and received a life sentence. David received the same sentence. Next up we have 14-year-old Joshua Phillips, who murdered his 8-year-old neighbor, Maddie Clifton, to death and hid her body under his bed. Phillips was from Florida. On November 15, 1998, Joshua had invited Maggie over to play catch. Now, Joshua claimed that he had thrown too hard and hit her in the head. To avoid getting in trouble, he beat her unconscious with a bat. Then he moved her to his room under the bed. She would later start to move and make sounds when she regained her consciousness. Phillips claimed that he panicked and fearing his father's reaction, he strangled her with a phone cord and stabbed her 11 times to shut her up. When Maddie was reported missing, the first suspect was Larry Grisham, another neighbor who had a criminal record with two sexual assaults. Joshua even offered to help in the search to make himself look innocent. Seven days later while cleaning the room, Philip's mom noticed something leaking, from beneath the bed. A closer inspection would reveal a body was hidden in the base of a waterbed. The body showed blunt force trauma and multiple stabbings. She immediately notified the police. Now, the autopsy did not reveal any sexual assault, but Maddie's body was found nude from the waist down. Phillips' story failed to convince a Florida jury, who convicted him of first-degree murder. Philip was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility for parole. His mother is still appealing his conviction based upon the fact that he was given an adult penalty for his crime. The murder appears to have been motivated by Phillips's fear of his abusive father, who would have been very angry had he found Maddie hurt at their house. Number 3. Paul Henry Gingrich. Paul was only 12 years old when he helped murder Philip Danner, the stepfather of his friend, Colt Lunty, who himself was 15. They lived in northern Indiana. Paul, Lunty, and another friend wanted to run away to Arizona. But, Lunty feared his stepfather would catch them before they got very far. So, the three of them devised a plan to kill him. However, the third friend backed out of the plan at the last minute, but, Lunty convinced Paul to follow through with it. They stole the gun from the stepdad. The two of them shot his stepfather four times in the chest, one afternoon when he walked into the living room. The boys were all sentenced to prison time, but Paul received the longest punishment of 30 years in prison, for firing the shot that would kill the dad. However, it was with the possibility of parole at the age of 18. Twelve-year-old Paul became the youngest kid in the state's history to be tried and sentenced as an adult. Next up we have the boy who was responsible for change in the laws for trying juveniles in New York. Willie Bosket. Willie was born in Harlem, New York on 9 December, 1962, to a father who killed two people shortly after his son was conceived, and thereafter spent his life in prison. He was in and out of trouble growing up, a violent child. And he wore this as a badge of honor, telling juvenile authorities that he would be a killer just like his father. 
He committed his first murder on March 19, 1978 when he was 15, shooting and killing Noel Perez in an attempted robbery on the New York subway. And just 8 days later, Bosquet shot another man, Moises Perez, in another botched robbery attempt. He also killed a transport worker, before the police got to him. He was tried as a minor and was given five years in the youth facility, a sentence seen as extremely light. There was a massive outcry against his light sentence, which led to the Juvenile Offender Act of 1978, which ruled that children as young as 13 could be tried in New York's adult courts for crimes as serious as murder, and receive the same penalties as adults. Bosquet was released when he was 20. Yet, he continued his life of crime, leaving and re-entering jail, until receiving a life sentence for assault and arson, while in prison in 1989. He is currently in the New York prison system, in solitary confinement. Next up, we have our first woman on the list. Brenda Ann Spencer. In 1979, Spencer masterminded an elementary school shooting in San Diego, California. On Monday, January 29, 1979, 16-year-old Brenda Ann Spencer used a rifle, to wound eight children and one police officer, at Cleveland Elementary School in San Diego. Spencer lived across the street from the school, and shot at the students and teachers, from her bedroom window. She used the rifle she had recently been given for Christmas, by her father. When the six-hour incident ended and the teenager was asked why she had committed the crime, she shrugged and replied. Her lack of remorse and inability to provide a serious explanation for her actions when captured was shocking. Even though she was only 16 years old, she was tried in court as an adult and given an indefinite sentence. She's currently in prison. Next, we have perhaps the most famous child murder in UK history. John Venables and Robert Thompson became the youngest convicted murderers in England at only 10 years old, after killing two-year-old, James Bulger, in 1993. On Friday, February 12 in 1993, two 10-year-olds, Robert Thompson and John Venables, snuck out of school, stole sweets, batteries and a can of blue paint before abducting two-year-old James Bulger. The twisted pair walked him several miles to an abandoned railway station, where they began torturing him. They threw paint in his eye, kicked and stomped on him, threw bricks and stones at him, beat him with an iron bar, then dropped a 10 kilograms iron plate on him. All of this to a two-year-old. The case pathologist said that there were so many injuries, that, not one could be isolated as causing the fatal injury. The boys left James laid across the railway tracks, with his head weighed down. After they left the scene, his body was cut in half by a train. A pathologist confirmed that the little boy had died before the train hit him. CCTV footage and 38 members of the public witnessed the psychotic children walking with James and the pair were arrested and found guilty of the crime on November 24, 1993. After trial and conviction, the now 11-year-old boys were sentenced to serve 15 years. The huge media interest in the trial as well as their young ages led to numerous reviews of their sentence, going all the way up to the European Court of Human Rights. The, the boys were released from prison on license in 2001, aged 18, with new identities to protect them for life. Yet. Venables was imprisoned in 2010 for child pornography charges and, after being given, yet another new identity, he was reportedly released from prison in September 2013. Number 7. Eric Smith. Eric was just barely into his teen years at 13, when on August 2, 1993, while riding his bike to a summer day camp at a local park in Steuben County, New York, he bumped into four-year-old Derek Roby. Who was walking alone. Derek and Eric lived in separate areas of the town, although, they both went to the same basketball program, only about a block from Derek's residence. Derek's mom was looking after her youngest kid, and that's why she let her son walk that block by himself. 
Smith lured the small boy into a wooded area, strangled him, dropped two large rocks on his head, undressed him and then sodomized the body with a tree limb. He was eventually convicted of second-degree murder, and sentenced to the maximum term then available for juvenile murderers. A minimum of nine years, to life in prison. In 2005, Smith claimed that his family life was abusive, and the effect upon him was as devastating as the bullying. After being bullied by friends and family for years, the 13-year-old lashed out and murdered Derek. He said that he took out all of his pent-up rage on Robbie. However, his inability to express emotion while saying such words leads court psychologists to believe that Eric Smith could never be fully rehabilitated and released into society. While he is subject to parole every two years, he has so far been denied nine times since 2001, and will next be up in 2020. David Brom Brom was 16 years old when he slaughtered his family inside their home in Rochester, Minnesota. He had gotten into an argument with his father one night, over the music he was listening to. He ended up hitting his father repeatedly in the head with an axe the next morning. Then he killed his mother and brother next. When he saw his sister standing over their mother's body upstairs, he killed her too. He hid the axe in the basement and went to school, as if nothing had happened. The day before, he'd supposedly been telling classmates that he was planning on killing his family that night. At school he bragged about how he murdered his family to a friend, detailing the whole thing to her. When the rumor, that he had hacked his family up with an axe, began spreading around the school, the police looked into it and found all four bodies in his home. Brom was convicted of first-degree murder and was given three consecutive life sentences. He's eligible for parole in 2041. Next up, we have, Elisa Bustamante. Elisa was a troubled teenager who had a history of depression, self-harm and suicide attempts. Alyssa was just 15 in 2009, when she lured her 9-year-old neighbor, Elizabeth Olton, into the woods, where she strangled her, then slit her neck and wrists, before burying her in a shallow grave. She buried the body of her victim close to her house, and when the body was retrieved, the police noted that Alyssa had dug two graves. She explained that she enjoyed digging holes, but police suggest that two of her younger siblings may have been the initial intended victims. Before the murder, Alyssa had been fighting depression and even tried committing suicide. She was on a high dose of Prozac when she committed the murder. She played dangerous pranks on her siblings and often expressed interest in killing her two younger brothers. Alyssa wrote about the killing in her diary, calling it pretty enjoyable. This is what she had written. Alyssa was charged with first-degree murder and tried as an adult, getting a life sentence with the possibility of parole. Last on the list, we have the youngest murderer in history. Emma Urjit Sada. He was an 8-year-old at the time. This young serial killer's victims were all babies who were hardly a few months old. He started his stint in 2006 by murdering his 6-month-old cousin, the daughter of a maternal uncle. The second victim of his killing spree was his own eight-month-old sister and yet his parents covered up his crime. While his family and some villagers, were aware of the child's involvement in these two murders, they were considered family matters, and went unreported. In 2007, he killed yet again. His third victim was a six-month-old neighbor's baby girl. He killed her by smashing her head with a brick and dumped her body in the bushes. The boy was apparently picked up by the police, as his neighbors suspected his involvement in their daughter going missing. The boy confessed that he killed the girl, and did not even fret, before revealing the gruesome graphic explanation, of how he killed the baby. When he was asked about the reason, as to why he killed the little girl, he smiled and instead asked for biscuits. When doctors examined him, it was revealed that the boy suffered from conduct disorder. While one psychiatrist revealed that he was a sadist who found injuring others pleasurable, another member of the psychology field pointed out that he didn't appear to have any concept of knowing what is right from wrong. But, 
At the end of his case study, the young serial killer was diagnosed with this conduct disorder. It is believed that this chemical imbalance can be successfully treated with medication. According to the Indian law, this young serial killer could not be convicted, as he was way too young to be punished. And as a result, it is believed that he served only three years of imprisonment, while a few reports claim that he spent his time in a psychiatric facility. There are no concrete details of his punishment or his current whereabouts. Hence, it is assumed that he's living free under an assumed name. That was the end of our today's video. If you liked this video, consider liking and sharing the video. The second part of this video will feature a case that has a Star Wars connection. Subscribe if you want such riveting and entertaining content in the future. We will be coming up with more every week. Thank you for watching. We hope you'll come back for more.